Takanatsu Techai, a 17-year-old boy, is the captain of Hanabishi High School's baseball club. Thanks to his extraordinary talent, he became a hot topic among baseball fans throughout Japan. With a variety of right-handed orthodox curvy balls and a maximum pitching velocity of 158 km per hour, he was a slugger with a batting average of 07. Loved by both men and women alike, he was a popular boy destined to become a pro player and rise to new heights. But at the peak of his popularity, a terrible accident occurred while he was returning from Kaushin. When he met his demise and took his last breath at the hospital, voices of lamentation could be heard throughout Japan. In a comedic turn of events, he found himself in the shabby apartment of an old man who called himself the Great God. The old man was grumpy at the boy dying too suddenly. According to him, he was supposed to be the future of baseball in Japan, and it all ruined because of him dying out of the blue. Our boy Takanatsu for our convenience, we will call him Toko. So, Toko was just sitting there, having no clue about what to answer to the crazy-looking old man. No matter what he did, he found it hard to believe that the tiny grumpy man is actually a god. The man told him he wasn't just a god, he was an almighty one, even amongst the gods. But Toko wasn't believing him. The old man shared some embarrassing stuff from his past life that only Toko knew, which made him believe the old man that he is a god who knows everything. The old man asked him if he was okay just dying like that. Toko was frustrated as he didn't get the chance to do anything for his mom or his grandpa but now he was helpless as he was already dead. The old man told him that it isn't over yet. He promised to bring him back to life once again. Toko got real excited hearing he could have another chance at life, but the old man told him that it won't be for free. He was going to send him to another world so that he can provide those people there with some virtue. A new world called Gallia. The folks in that world have been raging war against each other for so long. Thirty years ago, the god came up with an idea to stop the killings and taught them how to play baseball. So, they can sort out their disputes by sending their best representatives to play against each other. Toko understood that those people are using a baseball match as alternatives to actual bloody wars. The old man continued that those nations that are weak at baseball are having a hard time. So, he had decided to send him to one of the weak nations and be tasked with saving a nation called Freedom. The old man told him that if he provided them with enough virtue, then he will return the favor by bringing him back to life. After thinking about it, flashbacks of his mom and grandpa working hard for him and his teammates flashed in front of his eyes, which made it easier to make a decision. He accepted the task proposed by the god that can bring him back to life one day. He asked the god to let him play baseball again. Suddenly the floor started to shake and things started floating all around the house. The old man informed him that the foreign language should be in his head already. On top of that, he also took care of his fatigue from the national tournament. After that, he left the room, wishing him good luck for his new life ahead. Toko was still floating in the air like he got caught up in a heavy earthquake. After some time, when he opened his eyes, he found himself lying on the grass. From the corner of his eyes, he saw the sun shining right above his head and birds chirping in the trees. A girl greeted him excitedly, seeing that he finally opened his eyes. He was startled by seeing a small little fairy so close to her after opening his eyes. He was surprised to know that he was falling down a minute ago. The little fairy was equally startled because of him. She introduced herself as Marin, the supervisor for the baseball team of Galia Eastern Nation Freedom. Surprisingly, she even knew his name. She told him that they already heard about a human arrival from God, so she came here to pick him up. Excitedly, she told him that she heard from the God that he is really good at baseball, and they are so excited to have someone like him on their team now. Watching a fairy in front of him and him being present in a new world was proof that his dream of coming back to life could actually become true once again. She told him not to worry about a thing as he is the best high school baseball player. He requested her to introduce him to the other nine players on their team. 
the little fairy Marin took him to a place that looked the same as a baseball stadium. Lots of people were gathered there to watch the match. Marin started introducing the players to him. The first is a girl named Crush, and she was the ace of the team, the pitcher. Observing her throwing the ball, he could tell that it looked like it's around 130 km per hour speed and wondered if she removed her armor, she could be faster. Still, Marin told him that Crush is from the knight lineage, so her removing her armor is the same as accepting defeat. Toko asked Marin why she is throwing only straight balls. Marin couldn't understand what's wrong with straight balls, so Toko clarified that he meant why she isn't throwing curve balls. Marin laughed and told him that weak nations like them can't use those magic balls that can bend or drop. She told him that the opposing team's ace might be able to do it, so he should watch closely. As expected, the ball of the opposing team's ace curved and changed its course midway. Marin couldn't understand why the ball is bending, even though the use of magic is banned in games, but Toko already decided to become the pitcher for the team. The pitcher problem is one thing, but the other players weren't looking promising either. Some women, a bunch of kids, some old folks, and somehow a dog as well. He was told that they were going to be weak, but he didn't expect it to be this bad. He asked Marin if there were any young male players in the team. A gloomy expression appeared on her face, and she told him that these eight people and the dog are the best they have got right now. To free their people who are enslaved, they had no choice but to rely on this team. In Galia, everything is resolved with baseball, and anything can be put on the table as a wager, and that includes territory and people as well. For nations who are weak like them, they use their own people as wagers. There was one young adult left in the team named Nina. Everyone else was already taken away by the enemies. With her tiny little hands, she held Toko's finger and pleaded with him to help them save their people. Toko could finally understand why the team looked like this. It was 47-0 on the scoreboard, yet no one was ready to accept defeat. They were all ready to go all out till the very end to give their best shot. All of them were desperate to meet their family again. He laughed and told Marin not to worry anymore as he will take charge of everything. Marin couldn't hold her excitement and hugged his finger while thanking him for his willingness to help. In this world, baseball wasn't just a game, it was like a serious war, and Toko finally understood it. Baseball techniques can be like weapons of war. If one possesses techniques that others do not know of, they are in a more advantageous position. For the people of this world to be impressed by the curvy ball showed that the baseball techniques were still unknown yet. He was determined to turn his baseball knowledge into weapons in this world and help these people. Standing up, he stretched his body and confidently declared to Marin that he will make this team stronger than all the others. Crush looked pretty exhausted from all the hours of playing when Nina came near to her and handed her a towel. Crush was disappointed that she couldn't do anything for her people, as the mountain had been seized by the Wolfsmund now, and it wasn't possible to get food to pass through it. There was a threat of a harsh winter ahead because of a low supply of edibles. Tears started rolling down her face while she blamed herself for being so useless. Suddenly, they heard a commotion. Toko entered the stadium, and everyone wondered about his identity. Marin told them he is their new team member. With confidence beaming on his face, he introduced himself to the team and told them he would be in charge of the team from today. He wants all of them to follow his instructions and train like their lives depend on it. Before anyone could say anything, Wolfsmun guys came there. They overheard the conversation and started making fun of them. They even went as low as saying that he might be a good replacement for the dog in the team, but they doubt if a weak, slow, and dull race like humans could be any help to them. One of them mockingly offered Crush to join their team. Toko realized that it's always the same in every world. The powerful always bully the weak, but this time he didn't have any intention to just sit back and let it happen. He stood in front of Crush and stared into the eyes of the Wolfsmund men, mocking them and calling them dogs. The Wolfsmund guys got really angry over the insult and grabbed him by his collar. 
Marin interfered and asked Toko to apologize quickly, but he denied. He looked at the person holding his collar and called him out for being proud of defeating a team of women and old people. He told them it will take one week to train them properly, and then this very team can kick their butts. The other guy got pretty mad and was about to hit Toko when the ace of that team stopped him. She warned him that acts of violence during a match are forbidden and they might get a penalty for it. She then addressed Toko and agreed to give him one week of time as he asked earlier and warned him that there will be severe consequences for insulting them if he doesn't prove his worth as a player. She was planning to make him regret every word he said about them. After they left, Nino scolded Toko for putting them in a tight spot. One week was not enough to defeat Wolfsmund. Crush also shouted at him that he appeared out of nowhere and created a big problem for them. She pointed his bat towards him and warned him that she wouldn't let him do as he pleases. Toko, who listened to them calmly, politely challenged them to a match to decide if he is worthy to become their leader. The conditions were simple. Whoever strikes first will follow the orders of the winning person. Crush happily agreed, thinking of him as nothing but a weak person. Marin played the role of umpire for the match. She stepped forward to explain the rules. Both of them will take turns batting and pitching. Whoever strikes first will lose. Foul balls and homers will be treated as hits. The match started, and Toko initiated with a bang. A home run right off the bat on the play ball. They switched positions. Only one ball was enough to tell Crush that he was not just bluffing about his skills. But she put on a tough face and said to him that she is a little tired from the match a few moments ago. Toko agreed that it's unfair to play against him right after the other match she played, so he decided to make it easier for her. He said that her previous match didn't go past 5 innings so her total strikeout count was 12, so he will pitch until she can strike out 12 times. Crush ground her teeth with frustration over how easy he was taking her as an opponent. Her pride got the best of her, and she refused to accept the handicap from an incompetent human like him. Toko was unfazed and warned her that he will not hold back then. He got in the position and swung the ball at her. Crush was ready with her bat, but couldn't even move when the ball passed through her because of its incredible speed. Everyone was speechless. Marin announced the strike. Nino exclaimed that the ball was even faster than the werewolf Yuri's pitch. They all looked impressed by his superhuman abilities. Without wasting any moment, he threw the next ball at Crush, who was still processing his last move. Due to the high-speed ball, she tried to dodge it and lost her balance and fell on the ground. Marin again announced that it was a strike. Crush got up. Her mind couldn't accept how skillfully he was throwing the ball. It was something that she had never seen before. Could it be the magic ball that they have heard about? She looked at Toko, who was already standing in the position to throw his third ball. Along with the underdeveloped baseball techniques in Galia, physical attributes were also an important aspect. Compared to other humans like demi-humans and beastmen, humans were not gifted when it comes to physical attributes. This was the reason Crush didn't take Toko seriously, and that turned out to be a big mistake. On Earth, baseball continued to evolve since its creation. It's an enormously popular sport that has been meticulously researched and studied. Japanese high school baseball teams have a huge following across the country, and within those teams there were many elite players. Takanatsu Teichai was the one who stood at the top of those elites, therefore she had no chance of winning against such a formidable player. He wasn't just a member of the weakest race in Galia, but a person born from humanity's research and passion towards baseball. A bona fide baseball player. After the third strike, Marin announced him as the winner of the game. Crush was sitting on the ground, thinking about what just happened. Toko went near her and offered his hand to help her stand up. He gently smiled and told her that he is the same as them, who would do anything for the sake of his family, so he is ready to help them. A little frustrated, Crush shook his hand, accepting her defeat gracefully. After a while, they all returned to the village together. Toko was surprised to find many kids there. 
Marin warmly welcomed him to Freedom's capital explaining, these children are our citizens. Their parents were taken as slaves during this baseball war, and now these kids help by farming and preparing food. One curious child approached Nina, asking about the match. Her face saddened as she shared the tale of their defeat. Unable to hold back their sorrow, tears started rolling down the tiny faces of the children. After consoling them for a moment, Nina gently held one child by the arms and promised that they won't face such a loss again, they'll reclaim everything from the werewolves. Witnessing this touching moment, Toko chimed in, expressing that a strong ally has joined them, and they are determined not to lose to anyone. The kids looked at him with curiosity, as he was a new face to them, the dinner that night felt like a big celebration for their new team member. Everyone's faces were full of excitement as they enjoyed the delicious food. Nina even praised Marin for bringing such a talented young boy to their team. Marin shared that Toko has his own goal. Toko explained that to get another chance at life in his world, he's been tasked to provide this country with some virtue and help them win the fight. Since they all have the same goal, he hoped to get along well with them. The other team members were three girls named ATI, playing first base, Eris at shortstop, and Iris at second base. All three of them agreed to Toko with one voice, while Crush still seemed a little annoyed. Nina expressed her amazement as she never thought a human could throw such an amazing pitch with that power. But Toko said it's not as simple as they think. To explain better, he asked Nina if she thinks she can catch his pitch. The answer was a definite no. He explained that it doesn't matter how great a pitch he can throw, if the catcher can't catch it, it's useless because it will be ruled as a passed ball, he then asked Nina if she had a problem with her shoulders, and Nina mentioned that she had been having shoulder pain lately. Toko asked her why she chose to become a catcher, and Nina said she is the only one who could catch Crush's pitches. Toko, being strict and straightforward, said he needs to change the pitcher. Crush asked him if there is anyone suitable for that role. Contrary to her expectation, it was her that he had in mind as the new catcher. Crush asked him angrily why, and he said it's because she has a big butt. Crush got more upset because she thought he was making fun of her. But Toko explained that she has a good foundation, so it wouldn't take long for her to get up to scratch. Their next match is just in a week, so they don't have much time left. He told her to hurry up and start a relationship with him, and she isn't allowed to have any objections to that. In his mind, there are other hidden motives behind this sudden order which are still unknown to us. Crush got flustered by such a strange request, but before she could say anything, Toko reminded her of her own words about a knight never backing down on her words. She couldn't say anything as she believed that she is basically his property now after losing in the duel. Even in frustration, she blushed expressing her consent on the relationship order. At night, Toko decided to take a hot bath to relax his shoulders and body. He noticed that there were two moons in the sky. It still felt surreal to think that he was in another world now. But the good aspect was that his goal was crystal clear in his mind. All he had to do is win and then keep winning no matter what. And for that, he needed Crush to get better as well. As he was lost in his thoughts, someone opened the door and entered the bath area. It was Crush, who wasn't wearing any clothes. This was a shocking sight for Toko as he shouted, What is she doing here? Crush reminded him of his early orders about starting a relationship with him, so she came here to wash his back. She said a knight never goes back on her words, and now she will try to do everything he says. Hesitantly, Toko started to explain that this is not what he meant by a relationship. In his world, when someone talks about baseball and relationships, it's referring to the connection between a pitcher and a catcher, like how they need to trust each other a whole lot to do well. Tears started coming up in Crush's eyes because of embarrassment as she got up and ran out of there. He felt bad and asked her to hit him if it makes her feel better. Bro really messed up. After some time, the door opened again, and Crush entered once more. This time she was wearing clothes, but there was a big sword in her hands. 
She angrily swung the sword and shouted that he should have explained it better. Toko panicked and told her to stop because she will hurt for real if she hits him with that. The next morning, they started their vigorous training to become stronger than the Wolfsmund. Due to the limited time available, they couldn't just do the standard strength training and be satisfied with it. So Toko decided to start the first day of training with hula hoops and told them to spin these around. Marin asked how this hula hoops training would help them in baseball. Toko explained that in baseball, the players have to utilize their hips for a lot of movements. The hula hoops will give their hip area a new magical power, all thanks to the result of a century worth of baseball research in Japan. He told them to spin these hula hoops even if they think that he is fooling around. The results they will get at the end of the training will be worth all the effort. Crush was also spinning the hula hoop when Toko thought of something. He requested Marin to take over the charge for training and keep an eye on everyone, and then called Crush. Crush, still upset about the previous night's incident, annoyed, asked him what he wants. He told her to follow him as they have special training to do just the two of them. He took her to another area where they started practicing pitching and catching. He assured her not to let yesterday's misunderstanding get in the way of their training, and Crush promised that it won't happen. That's all he wanted to hear from her. He told her that she needs to be able to receive his pitches by the time they face the Wolfsmund again. Looking at him, Crush thought that last time she underestimated him because of him being a simple human, but this time she won't get fooled. It's just a fast ball that she needs to hit. She knew that she can pitch that kind of ball, but catching it would be relatively easy. All she had to do is follow the ball. While lost in her thoughts, she didn't even realize when the ball got close to her face just a few centimeters away and hit her head. The impact was so strong that she fell on the ground. She couldn't understand what just happened and how the ball appeared in front of her out of nowhere in such a short amount of time. She got up and looked at Toko, who was getting ready for their next ball. He said, I already warned you that this training will not be easy. I am normally not a fan of Spartan training. However, we need you to get to the point of being able to receive pitches or there will be no point in all of this, so you better try your best to keep up. The training persisted, and it didn't improve for Crush. Toko kept throwing balls at her that she couldn't catch with her bat at all. Despite her utmost efforts, all the ball touched were different parts of her body. No matter how hard she tried to look, she couldn't see the ball coming at her. It always ended up right in front of her before she could even spot it. This time, the ball missed her eyes just by an inch and smashed on the net behind her. Marin, who was watching all this, couldn't hold herself anymore and said to Toko that even if she is wearing her armor, she is still just a girl. So he should cut her some slack. She was mad that he kept telling her to keep up because they have only one week, but in fact, he shouldn't have made that kind of promise to Wolfsmund in the first place. In a serious tone, Toko said that in this world, baseball is a war. If you lose, everything will be taken away from you, so they should be ready at any time. A week or two doesn't matter. It could happen at any moment, and if they're not ready, it would be too late for them to regret. He asked Crush if she can continue, but Crush looked completely exhausted. Reluctantly, he decided to call it a day and stop the training. He quietly left the training field without saying a word to Crush. Marin came near to her, but she got up and ran away into the jungle. Sitting on the edge of a rock near a waterfall, she was thinking about how she thought it was going to be easy to catch the ball, but in reality, she couldn't even spot it once. She was frustrated over her incompetence and couldn't believe that she was this weak. Suddenly, Nina came there looking for her. Whenever something happened, Crush always used to come to this spot, so it wasn't hard for Nina to find her in this big forest. She started removing her clothes, and when Crush asked why she was doing that, she told her that after her special training, Toko pitched his magic curve balls at everyone else, which was even harder than they expected. So she came here to wash away the sweat from all the hard training. She jumped in the water, and the water was even more refreshing than she expected. 
Crush apologized to her that when everyone is having such a hard time and trying their best, all she did was talk. She couldn't see the ball and got frustrated. Toko must also be disappointed with her over her behavior. Nina smiled and told her that's not true. After she left, Nina asked Toko what would happen if Crush gave up. They would lose this war, but Toko disagreed with her. He was fully confident that she wouldn't give up this easily, and he was somehow sure she would be able to catch his pitches very soon. His trust in her strength is unwavering, and he has seen the potential in her to turn the tables. Toko told Nina that he could see the will to win in Crush's eyes when she stepped on the mound, and it didn't disappear until the match was over. He was really impressed with her spirit and, to be honest, a little bit jealous as well. He shared that ever since he was young, catchers playing with him had a tough time receiving his pitches and often had to get substituted. Those who didn't want to be substituted frequently would go through rigorous training, always ending up like a hardcore Spartan training. He believes that she is the only one who can overcome that kind of training. Nina asked him that they only met yesterday, and while he is pushing her to the brink like this, how can they develop a relationship as teammates? He pitched a ball at the net with full force. The ball hit the net and came back with even greater force, which he caught with ease. He said that he doesn't care if she hates him, as he is not here to play around. She needs to develop the mindset that no matter what kind of pitch it is, she can catch it. When she has that mindset, I can pitch with all I have, and that's what we call trust between teammates. This is the reason he doesn't plan to hold back even a little. Nina came out of the water all refreshed and told her that Toko is pretty observant towards all of us, and his observations can't be wrong about her true strength. Crush, with newfound determination on her face, got up from his place as she made up his mind to become his catcher and do whatever it takes to reach that goal. The following morning, Toko went for a run in the forest accompanied by Marin, who was holding a lamp due to the early hour. Marin was impressed by Toko's dedication to training so early in the morning while everyone else was still asleep. Toko expressed his gratitude to Marin for joining him explaining that he didn't want to become rusty. Upon their return to camp, they were surprised to find Crush already waiting for them. She had also woken up early to start training. After three days of training, Crush was able to see and touch the ball with her mitts, but she still struggled to catch it properly. Nevertheless, she was determined to improve. Toko was pleased with the progress they had made. Four days into the training, Crush finally grasped the reason behind her initial difficulty in seeing the ball. Toko's pitching technique involved concealing the ball during the pitch, making it challenging for the batter to see. This technique, reminiscent of the strategies used in Major League Baseball, required the pitcher to only show half of their body during the pitch, with the other half revealed at the last moment before releasing the ball. This allowed the pitcher to maximize the power generated by their body rotation and almost entirely conceal the ball. Crush's ability to successfully catch Toko's pitches was vital for their team's success. She was committed to improving her skills. When she finally caught one of Toko's pitches, it was both painful and satisfying. Toko, filled with excitement, hugged her and encouraged her to remember this feeling. They continued their training, unaware that they were being observed by others who shared in their excitement. Crush's mind was in a whirlwind of thoughts, contemplating Toko's spontaneous hug and feeling both perplexed and elated about her first successful catch. Meanwhile, Toko, although feeling a sense of embarrassment for hugging her, believed it was necessary for team bonding. As time passed, the day of the rematch drew closer. The eagerly awaited day of the rematch against Wolfsmund had finally arrived. Crush, accompanied by Toko, made her way to a palace that bore a striking resemblance to a cemetery. Toko soon discovered that these were not ordinary graves, but a tribute to those taken as slaves who had tragically lost their lives through grueling labor in the enemy's territory. She shared the heartbreaking revelation that her parents' remains were never returned, and the villagers established these graves as a poignant reminder of their departed loved ones. Toko struggled with the realization that in this world, baseball was similar to a war. 
despite its apparent peaceful approach compared to bloody conflicts. The use of baseball for such heinous purposes was a bitter pill to swallow. Baseball, in Toko's view, should be a source of joy, not a cause of misfortune that ruins lives. Lost in his thoughts, he failed to notice the arrival of the other team members, who appeared high-spirited and ready to face the arrogant and bullying Wolfsmann team in the upcoming rematch. They all looked high in spirits ready to face the challenge that lie ahead of them. In the Wolfsmann territory, folks were buzzing about the big match set for today between Freedom and Wolfsmund. Some even joked that it might be Freedom's last game, suggesting they wouldn't play again after today's likely defeat. Many people gathered eagerly in the stadium for this much-anticipated match. The pitcher from the Wolf team greeted them, but not in a friendly way. He was surprised to see Toko and complimented him for having the courage to show up. Unfazed by his unfriendly tone, Toko stated he had no reason to back down. He got a bit upset, thinking he still believed he could beat them after just a week of training. He was determined to make him regret underestimating the mighty werewolf tribe. Wolfsmund had evil plans to take over Freedom's farmlands and food supplies if they won. With confidence, Toko mentioned they had everything at stake, even discussing the terms on the way there. Marin, a bit scared but determined, was asked by Toko to share the details. She bravely declared an open challenge to Wolfsmund for a final game. Riam, the Wolfsmund supervisor, and a fairy like Marin intervened, questioning if they even knew what they were doing. Marin explained that when God changed the way wars happened to baseball, a pact was made the final game. In this game, both sides can risk everything. Riam warned them again that the losing side would be taken over by the winner. Marin assured Riam that they understood this well. Toko pointed out that Freedom's small village couldn't compare to the big city, making it an unfair bet. To make things more interesting, he proposed that if Freedom could score just one point, it would be considered a victory for Wolfsmund. He added a playful jab, hoping they wouldn't run away, especially since werewolves have tails. The pitcher, angered by Toko's comments, couldn't forgive a human looking down on them and vowed to crush them. He threatened that after the match, they would all become slaves and face the most painful death imaginable. Toko found it scary to hear such threats before a baseball game, still struggling to grasp that lives in this world depended on baseball matches. Suddenly, someone grabbed Toko's butt from behind a werewolf girl named Farah, Yuri's younger sister and a center fielder. Although she wouldn't be playing in the match, she had heard a lot about Toko from others. Her initially friendly and cute tone suddenly turned somewhat evil and malicious. She remarked, I was curious about what you'd be like, but now that I see you, you're just an idiot who doesn't know their place. After we beat you, I'll make you my pet. Shortly before the match started, Freedom's team warmed up for the big finale. Despite everyone feeling nervous, they were determined to win. Mina expressed concern to Toko, questioning if they would be okay since they had only practiced spinning the hula hoop all week, hadn't hit any curve balls, and were told they could win with just one point a risky move. Toko acknowledged the risk, but emphasized they couldn't waste any more time. They couldn't wait and risk more deaths among their people. With confidence in his eyes, he assured them that as long as he's on the mound, no one would be able to reach first base. Everyone took their designated positions, and tension filled the air as both teams geared up to outdo the other. For Wolfsmund, it was a matter of pride, while for Freedom, this match meant survival and the lives of their loved ones. The match finally kicked off, with Toko starting things off by shouting, Play ball! He was well aware of the risks involved in this game, but believed it was necessary to defeat Wolfsmund and free those enslaved. His goal was to prove that baseball isn't something dark or depressing. With determination, he threw his first ball, and as expected, it was a total hit. The catcher couldn't even see the ball, it passed right through him. The entire stadium fell silent for a moment as everyone tried to process what had just happened before their eyes. Toko grinned with joy and declared, let's enjoy this otherworld baseball. 
With just one swift ball, he effectively scared them off with his super-fast pitch. Let's rewind a bit to when our baseball heroes were heading to Wolfsmund. In the carriage, they had a strategy meeting for the big match. Toko shared that Crush had excellent control and accuracy, with her pitches averaging 130 km per hour. Despite this, they lost 51-0, an unimaginable defeat. It seemed like the other team managed to hit the ball every single time. Marin suggested it might be because the other team's batters were highly skilled, but Toko disagreed. He explained that those batters swung the bat with brute strength, lacking the skill of a level swing. Despite Crush's threatening pitches, something fishy was going on. Nina asked if Toko thought they were hiding a secret. Toko nodded and asked her to share more about the werewolf tribe. Nina explained that werewolves, compared to humans, have higher physical abilities and are swifter on their feet. Iris added that they have poor eyesight, but Nina countered that their keen ears and nose make up for it. This information clicked in Toko's mind as if he finally understood their secret technique. Toko threw the ball again. The batter, thinking Toko's throws were fast for a human, believed his speed was on par with Yuri's. However, he felt it wouldn't be enough to stop them. With their keen werewolf senses, they could sense the mitt's exact position without even looking. He was furious over Toko's earlier comment that just one point would mean victory for them. In the carriage meeting, Iris asked if Toko had figured something out. Toko shared that it's the werewolf knows they can smell the mitt's position through sweat. This revelation shocked everyone. Nina pointed out that if the werewolves know the mitt's location, they can predict where the pitch is going. Crush, frustrated for not realizing it sooner, wondered if she could counter it by adjusting her mitt at the last moment. However, Toko advised against it, saying she's not ready yet to catch his full range of pitches even if she prepares herself. Crush worried they'd know exactly where to hit the ball, but Toko assured them they had another option. He explained that not all pitches are easy to hit, even if they fall in the strike zone. Additionally, the batter areas near the home plate are more restricted than one might think. Since werewolves can sniff out whether the pitch will land in the strike zone, they wait for the right pitch and then take a big swing. Looking at it differently, they are like sitting ducks. Toko shouted, Catcher, here it comes, and then threw the ball. This time, the batter couldn't track the exact location of the ball and got out. The next batter teased the previous one for losing to a human, but warned him that Toko is even better than expected, so he should stay alert. The second batter, confident that Toko couldn't bend the ball like Yuri, thought it would be easier. Toko noticed the second batter was a lefty, with a small body, short arms and legs, but slightly raised elbows, indicating he expected a fast ball. Toko told the third base to stay put as he predicted the ball would be a foul. The werewolf batter took the chance, swung hard, but it was, as Toko predicted, a foul ball. Despite being a human, Toko acknowledged the batter's strength. Toko once again told the third base to hold her position, predicting another foul. As expected, even after the werewolf tried, the ball was a foul, heightening the tense atmosphere. Now, Toko instructed ATI that the next ball would be a fly ball, so she should be ready to catch it. Yuri and Farah realized the batter wasn't likely to succeed. Dotshun's small size and short limbs made hitting the ball at that angle challenging. He had no choice but to hit it towards the third base. Farah suggested that Toko might have figured out their secret, using their tendency to swing big if they know it's in the strike zone to his advantage in dictating where they hit the ball. Yuri speculated that Toko's arrogant statements about winning with just one point were to provoke them and use their temperament against them. Farah got ready to join the match as the third batter after Dachshun got out. Yuri was plotting in her mind to defeat Freedom so they could have Toko all to themselves, believing he could help them greatly against the tough rabbits. Two other beast folks, one resembling a rabbit and the other a lizard, wandered the streets of Wolfsmund. The rabbit expressed frustration to the big lizard, mentioning he took the time to collect payment in person, yet the rude dogs from Freedom didn't even greet them. 
Drek, the lizard guy, asked what was happening. The rabbit explained there was a match between Wolfsmund and a country called Freedom, which hadn't heard of before. Drek seemed to recall something from the past, stating that Freedom hadn't been wiped out yet and dismissing them as worthless trash. Toko proudly gazed at his teammates and declared, It's two outs now, so let's keep this up till the very end. Farah entered the stadium, expressing that Toko was underestimating them a lot. She acknowledged his use of their own trick against them, but emphasized that, unlike the other two boys, it wouldn't work on her. Toko looked her straight in the eyes and remarked, The weaker the dog is, the louder they bark. Observing her standing posture, he realized she was positioned far back, suggesting she might be scared of the fast ball. The first ball turned out to be a strike, and Farah didn't even flinch when it passed through her. She commented that experiencing the pitch up close made her understand why the other two guys had a hard time with it. Toko grasped that she stood further back to measure the pitch's course. Confident that she couldn't hit the ball after seeing his pitch, just once Toko threw again, resulting in a foul. Judging by her expressions, it seemed like she had finally grasped it and was now ready to hit the ball. Toko reconsidered his strategy in his mind. Seeing that Farah could connect with the ball after making some adjustments, it became evident that she possessed good judgment and reflexes. Among all the batters from Wolfsmund, she appeared to be the most formidable. Recognizing that a fast ball wouldn't suffice against her and being unable to throw an impromptu curvy ball without alerting the catcher, Toko found himself with only one viable option to leverage her strength against her. Instructing the second base to prepare for a grounder, he threw the ball, manipulating its path along the way. Farah realized her timing was off and she couldn't halt the momentum, but by then it was already too late. She made contact with the ball and it landed squarely in the hands of the second base. Swiftly, the second base threw it back, finding its way into Nina's mitt, resulting in Farah's defeat. The crowd was astonished to witness three outs in a row. It felt like a miracle to see a simple, frail human throwing these magical balls. Nina understood that it might be tough for others to grasp Toko's superhuman abilities. Farah, still in shock from being out, couldn't believe how Toko pitched a magic ball like Yuri. Everyone erupted with excitement, never imagining they'd witness such a day. They made sure to shower Iris with well-deserved praise for catching the ball perfectly. Crush hurried over to Toko and asked him to give her a heads up next time if he plans on pitching a magic ball. She expressed concern that if Farah hadn't hit the ball, it would have resulted in an uncaught third strike. However, Toko reassured her to calm down, mentioning that giving up one base is okay. He preferred that over risking the ball reaching the outfield, which could end up as an inside the park home run. Toko asked her to trust him with the pitching and declared that it was finally time to go on the offensive. They only had two people who could handle the curvy ball, Crush and ATI. Toko reminded ATI of what he told her during practice. There was a flaw in Yuri's curvy ball and they needed to capitalize on it. This time, Yuri stood as the pitcher and Crush took the role of the batter. Her teammates cheered her on from the sides to boost her morale. The first ball came in as a strike, fast as always. Crush thought that if Toko mentioned a flaw in Yuri's curvy ball, there was a good chance she could hit it. Yuri threw the ball again, and it was strike two. Crush was still trying to figure out the flaw Toko mentioned. The third ball turned out to be lucky for Crush, allowing her to reach the second base. Nina felt happy and amazed, it had been a while since they had a basser runner in a scoring position. Toko encouraged everyone to cheer for Crush simultaneously and asked the elder members to join in. All together they shouted, Good job, Crush! Crush heard them loud and clear, overwhelmed with emotions. She recalled Toko's earlier explanation about their pitcher, mentioning a fatal flaw in Yuri's pitch. To illustrate, Toko held a ball in his hand, showing them the difference between throwing a straight pitch and a curvy ball. He explained that the techniques are quite different, and they wouldn't be able to identify the pitch until after the pitcher released the ball. 
Toko continued explaining that there's a slight difference in the throwing forms of straight and curve balls. When a pitcher tries too hard to make the ball curve, they might expose their elbow, making that subtle difference noticeable. This small detail helps batters know which pitch is coming, and it's the fatal flaw in Yuri's powerful pitch. Crush felt happy that by spotting this difference in Yuri's form, she could predict the next pitch. She praised Toko and gained even more confidence that they could win the match. Instructing ATI to follow their practiced approach, ATI calmly nodded in agreement. On the flip side, Yuri was furious. He never expected someone to hit his magic ball so easily, finding it utterly unacceptable. ATI was a child who often thought about things. People mistakenly saw her as absent-minded, but she was actually a calm and composed girl who preferred observing people over talking. She always pondered what to eat and what games to play. Sometimes, while others started their activities, ATI was still lost in thought. When Nina saw her in the stadium, she couldn't help but worry asking Toko if ATI would be okay. This concern went back a few days to their special training with the magic ball when ATI surprised everyone by hitting it. Despite Nina praising her, ATI insisted it was nothing special. Her problem was that she could always manage to hit the ball during practice, but when it came to the real match, she couldn't do it. In her head, the only reason she had been chosen as a player was because she met the age requirement for drafting and she still thought of herself as useless. Toko noticed her frustration and praised her for her powerful swings. Crush chimed in and told him that ATI was mixed. She had Nina's human blood and the blood of a dwarf as well, so she had the power of her mother and the dexterity of her father. But the problem was her short legs that made her slow. Toko asked her why she couldn't hit a single hit during their last match against Wolfsmund. ATI apologized and explained that it was because Yuri was the pitcher. Her mind was full of thoughts about Yuri and his pitching rhythm, like where he was going to pitch and where she should hit the ball this time. Nina gently scolded her, telling her that she shouldn't drift into her thoughts while batting. Toko found the solution to her problem and offered to share a real simple tip that would help her control her thoughts more easily. Now back to the real game. ATI was already at two strikes. If it had been a practice match, she would have hit the ball without much problem. Addie's mind was filled with thoughts, feeling like things were always the same. She thought she couldn't match the pace and would get overwhelmed as usual. But this time, there was no need to match it. She remembered what Toko had told her earlier, if she needed to gather her thoughts during the match, all she had to do was step outside the batter's box. It was a privilege just for the batter. Once she was done thinking and observing, she could go back into the box. After that, all that was left was for her to believe in herself and hit the ball. Feeling a strong desire to meet Toko's expectations, she started shaking her butt. The audience was left bewildered, wondering if this was some kind of ritual. Nina was also worried about what she was doing in front of all these people. However, Toko explained that it was the hula hoop movement. ATI was using those motions to calm her nerves and put herself in the right state of mind. She successfully managed to ignore the surrounding noises and, finally done, got ready in her position again. Yuri was still thinking about how Crush managed to hit his magic ball. It was the first time something like this had happened, but he tried to calm himself down and focus on the current match. He had two strikes and zero balls, which was plenty to work with. The last two strikes were from normal pitches, so she was probably ready for them now. In that case, he decided to give her that magic ball that curves in from the outside. Unfortunately, ATI had already predicted his move and hit the ball. Crush, who was waiting for ATI to hit so she could run and score a point, excitedly made their first run. It was the first time they had ever scored before the other team. Nina was relieved and suggested that if ATI could hit like that, she should have gone for the first two pitches instead of waiting for the last one. Toko explained that ATI waited on purpose. She was waiting for that outside curve. 
With an outside curve, 9 out of 10 times, the ball would end up going to the first base, making it safer for Crush to get to the next base. Marin was still confused about how she predicted that ahead of time. So Toko explained that it was the very first time Crush hit Yuri's magic ball, making him anxious. As a pitcher, he wanted to throw a curve to check if something was off with his pitch. Curve balls are slower than straight ones, and it's quite hard to pitch a curve ball that goes in the opposite direction. If the pitcher is feeling anxious, there's also less chance of inside pitching, so an outside curve is the most likely option. Nina asked, does that mean ATI purposely gave up two strikes as bait for the magic ball? Toko said that a good batter carefully observes others, knows themselves well, and ATI is a good batter. Nina smiled, thinking that Toko was the first person who looked at ATI like that and silently thanked him. On the other hand, Yuri stood there in a state of denial. He couldn't believe his eyes how could a little hill hit his magic ball. He looked at Toko and wondered if it was because of him. Raging with anger, he couldn't think rationally. The supervisor tried to calm him down, but he was in no state to listen to anyone. The next batter was Takanashi Teishi, who effortlessly hit the first ball. Grinning as he looked at the scoreboard, he thought they just needed another seven points difference before the fifth innings, which wouldn't be so hard for them. In baseball, there is a rule called the mercy rule, where a game is over if a team leads by more than 10 runs after the fifth inning. The audience also started panicking. They're used to seeing their team winning easily, but that wasn't the case today. Freedom was dominating the leaderboard, crushing Wolfsmund's pride as the mighty werewolves. Everything was on the line in this single match. Yuri was panting heavily, exhausted both mentally and physically. Meanwhile, on the other side, Freedom players were overjoyed with happiness. Everyone was excited to see how well they were doing against a formidable strong team. All thanks to Toko's hula hoop training. To be good at baseball, you need a lot of things. According to modern science and research, one of those important things is a good and strong core. Toko used balancing as an example to explain the concept better. To prevent yourself from falling over, you instinctively use your core muscles to stabilize your body. He told Nina that at first, she had a problem rotating the hula hoop in the opposite direction because she couldn't fully utilize her core muscles. As a player gets better at using their core muscles, all their movements become faster and more efficient. They can essentially do things they were unable to do before. It's a bit different from strength training, where a player tries to add more on top of what they already have. Hula hoop training was just for them to get better at using what they already have. Because of that, they'll often see improvement quickly. This simply means that this group was stronger than the other team from the beginning. All they lacked was proper guidance and training, which Toko provided. He thought everything is under control now. The only problem left was the girl named Farah. She was the only one Toko was worried about now. Yuri was upset about his magic ball not working well. Losing was not something he wanted. Painful memories of a lizard guy named Drac bullying them resurfaced, demanding a hefty amount of money every month. Yuri knew that if they lost to freedom, they couldn't pay, and everyone would be in danger. Farah held him, shook him, bringing him back to reality. With a calm expression, she told him to calm down. She asked Riam if the condition of needing just one run to win was still valid. Riam quickly nodded yes, explaining that she and Marin had set this condition with God, so it wouldn't change now. Farah yelled that all they needed to do was hit the ball. The outfielders on Freedom's team were older people, so if they could manage to get a fly ball or slip a ball past the inner field, they would surely win. Yuri doubted if any of them could hit the ball at this point. Everyone was getting strikes from Toko's fast pitches, and he could also throw magic balls. With a confident grin, Farah said she could hit the ball, and that she had already seen the weakness in his pitches. Riam asked about the weakness, so Farah explained that when Yuri pitched his magic ball, his elbow got exposed, and the same was true for that guy as well. She fell for his trick once, but wouldn't do it again. 
This time, she would definitely hit the ball and bring them victory. Riam sighed in relief, thinking they were saved thanks to the one-point condition. Yuri also saw a glimmer of hope. He knew that Farah could sense the mitt and see the pitch based on the pitcher's movements, meaning she was the one who could definitely hit one of the balls thrown by that human guy. Toko threw the ball, it bounced off the ground and landed in Crush's mitt. She sensed that Toko was cautious about this girl, or maybe he was unsure of what pitch to throw. Farah was now sure that Toko had the same weakness as Yuri. She took a short break to go over the plan in her head again. She already figured out the timing for the fast ball, and now she could see the magic balls too. Toko's magic ball is the one that curves in from the right to the center. Since she could see it coming, she thought hitting it wouldn't be a big issue. Farah wasn't wrong in her assumptions. Toko tends to expose his elbow when pitching a breaking ball. Expert players could guess from Toko's pitching form that breaking balls weren't his strong point. Farah did well to find this weakness with her keen observation, however, Toko was fully aware of it. In fact, he was intentionally showing this weakness. He couldn't afford to give up even a single run, so he was secretly planning to take advantage of Farah's keen observation of his weakness. Observing his stance and the mitt's position, Farah predicted it would be a fast ball. She prepared to hit the ball, but unfortunately, it wasn't a fast ball. The ball was much slower than she expected. She couldn't understand why he would throw something like that at this point in the game. Suddenly, she noticed something. A fast ball exceeding 150 km per hour, along with various breaking balls, is a powerful combination. However, a crazy fast ball requires a good catcher. Breaking balls, on the other hand, can be detected by observing the pitcher's movements. There's actually another type of pitch one that looks identical to a fast ball in form. Despite having the same form, due to a different grip, it's significantly slower than the fast ball. It's a pitch any pitcher can throw and any catcher can catch, but it's not easily hit by batters. And the name of that pitch is the change-up, one of the most popular pitches in American baseball, known as the king of deceptive pitches. The referee signaled that it's an out. Farah couldn't believe how slow the pitch was despite Toko putting a lot of power into it. Toko told her it's probably because she guessed wrong. She realized he got her good this time. He knew about the weakness of his magic ball. He intentionally showed this weakness to make her believe she could figure out different pitches based on his movements. The truth is, he had her in his deceptive tricks from the very beginning. It was clear she couldn't beat him. It was no longer about skills. He was on a whole different level than the rest of them. Her fears eventually came true. Throughout the entire match, he used fast balls, breaking balls, and change-ups like a pro, and for the remaining time, none of the Wolfsmann batters could even hit any of those pitches. After some time, the game ended with Freedom winning in the fifth inning after pitching, emerging victorious over Wolfsmann. The game had ended. The scoreboard showed Freedom's victory. Crush found it hard to believe that they had won against the mighty Wolfsmanns. Eris hugged Crush in excitement. Everyone was surprised that they beat Wolfsmund after just a week of training. Tears rolled down Crush's eyes. All the hard work had finally paid off. She used to want to run away and never play baseball again. Always on the losing side, she feared causing suffering because of her incompetence. Her weakness meant everyone went hungry and she blamed herself for their misfortune. However, she never knew there was this joyful and fun side of baseball. Toko encouraged everyone to remember the happy feeling of winning and to keep getting better. He told them to be proud of their hard work. This victory happened because of them. Now that they've experienced winning, he believed they'd always want more, pushing them to improve even more. He was confident that everyone could become even stronger and be their best if they kept working hard. The audience was silent, they worried about the future of Wolfsmund. According to the Baseball War Pact, since they lost the final game, they were all going to get wiped out. The team was in chaos. One member suggested to Riem to cancel the final game, arguing that their grand city shouldn't have the same conditions as Freedom's small village. 
Riam explained it was too late, God had already accepted these conditions. Another member got angry, saying they wouldn't accept it, and suggested killing all of freedom to void the pact, as they were just weaklings. Yuri shouted at them to be quiet, reminding them of the last time they tried to settle things with force and how it ended. Yuri went to Toko and admitted Wolfsmund's defeat. Toko asked if that meant they were all part of freedom now. In Yuri's mind, he thought the baseball war pact didn't forbid killing or violent actions toward an annexed country. If Toko planned on harming or enslaving them, Yuri wasn't going to hold back. Yuri asked if being part of freedom meant that Toko would take good care of his people. Toko agreed, explaining he wanted this game in the first place because he needed their help. He assured Wolfsmund that freedom wouldn't oppress any of their people. Yuri, as the leader of Wolfsmund, took responsibility for their deaths. Suddenly, some uninvited guests arrived the rabbit and the lizard guy from earlier. Tension rose as everyone got all riled up, especially upon seeing the lizard guy named Drek. The only clueless person there was Toko, who had no idea what was going on. Crush yelled at him, questioning how he had the nerve to stand in front of them, calling him a traitor. Unfazed by her angry words, Drek only looked at her and said they were the ones with no shame who couldn't even protect their country. Toko asked Marin about the lizard guy since everyone seemed on edge because of him. Marin explained his name was Drek, a dragonute who was the pitcher of Freedom's baseball team before Crush. He deliberately lost a match against Watership Town, the rabbit folks, making everyone slaves. He was the most despicable traitor. Drek told them to hurry and leave as they were useless. Then, he looked at Yuri and said it was the day for them to pay for their existence. Marin asked Riam what the existence tax was. Riam explained that Wolfsmund lost a baseball war against WST a while ago, and because of that, they have to pay a hefty war reparation every month. Yuri shrugged, saying he wanted to give them the money, but after losing the final game against Freedom, now their city, people, and all the money belong to Freedom. Wolfsmund is completely broke. The rabbit guy got angry, thinking Yuri was trying to cheat them. Yuri knew he couldn't let them shift their debt onto Freedom. He said it's only him left in Wolfsmund, so all they can do is take him. Farah tried to stop him, warning him of the ill treatment he would face, but he told her to be quiet. As the leader of the werewolf tribe, Yuri decided to take responsibility for his failure. The rabbit guy got mad, saying one werewolf isn't enough to settle the debt. Yuri looked at him straight in the eyes and said that, according to the pact, it's either the money or the obedience, and they were the ones who gave them the option to choose, so they can't take it back now. Yuri was aware that what he was doing went against the rules. As the losing team, he was now a part of freedom, but he didn't want to burden them with Wolfsmund's debt. He knew freedom was not in a good position, so putting the debt on them would be cruel. Looking at Toko, he felt that Toko could take better care of the Wolfsmund people. Drek grabbed him by his collar and lifted him up. Drek said he knew what Yuri was trying to do using the pact to erase the debt and protect his buddies. He declared that they were going to invade freedom and take everything, and what Yuri was trying to do now wouldn't change anything. Announcing the fate of Wolfsmund, he mentioned that the rabbits still held grudges against them and warned not to expect a painless death. He painted a horrifying picture of their dreadful future at the hands of the rabbits while Yuri tried to free himself. Suddenly, someone grabbed his hand none other than our hero Toko. Drek got mad that a lowly human touched him and tried to punch him with his other hand. In a swift move, Toko grabbed his other hand, twisted it off, freeing Yuri from his grip. With an intimidating tone, Toko told Drek that Wolfsmund lost the final game to freedom and is completely taken over now. This means Yuri also belongs to him, and he doesn't recall giving Drek permission to touch him. He mentioned that initially he didn't plan to get involved, but now he had enough of their nonsense and disrespectful talk. Hearing about killing people just because they lost a baseball game was too much for him, and it irritated him that they saw baseball that way. With anger in his eyes, he made it clear to the lizard guy that he really detests it. Marin stepped in and asked them both to stop. 
She told Toko that violence is not allowed in all of Galia. If they continue acting this way, they will both face penalties according to the Baseball War Pact. Toko released his hand, reminding him that Wolfsmund is now part of freedom, and he shouldn't try to harm any of them. Yuri intervened, thinking what Toko was doing was foolish. He warned him that absorbing Wolfsmund into freedom meant taking on their debt as well. Even if Yuri was the only one left, Wolfsmund would still exist, so they should cut ties with him along with the debt. However, Toko quickly rejected this idea. Frustrated with the situation where people suffer and die because of baseball, Toko looked at Yuri, telling him to be quiet and just come with them since he lost, making it clear he doesn't get a say in this decision. Drek made fun of him and asked if it seemed like he's going to take responsibility for Wolfsmund's debt. Toko grinned and said he would take full responsibility for it. If anyone wants to get money from them, they should try using baseball to take it. That's the rule of this world after all. Drek asked Nether, the bunny guy, about when the first strings would come together. Nether said it should be in one month. Drek looked at Toko and his teammates, saying they only have one month to live their lives freely. If a country doesn't want to pay its debt, Invasion is considered a valid action according to the Baseball War Pact. He warned them that next time, he wouldn't show any mercy. The moment they lose, their women and even the kids would pay the price. He'd take their heads and display them in front of the scoreboards. So, be ready for it. It was a declaration of war that would happen in a short time, just one month. Later in the dining hall, everyone sat down for dinner together. Yuri asked Nina about Derek, and she explained that he used to be a citizen of freedom. A long time ago, a Dragonute was left in a forest within Freedom's territory. Crush's father, who was the leader of freedom at that time, found the baby and took him in out of pity. That baby grew up to be Drek, and he became childhood friends with Crush and ATI. Marin added that the Dragonute race has the highest physical abilities, surpassing all other races, even the demon kin. Currently, the Isle of Demons is the strongest country in the eastern area of this continent. Crush shared that Drek was mischievous as a kid, but as he grew, he noticed a significant power difference between him and others in freedom. He started changing, looking down on those around him, and sometimes resorted to violence. Despite all this, he was a formidable player on their team, and even the leader of freedom couldn't do much about it. Eventually, he betrayed them by deliberately throwing a game, jeopardizing freedom's fate. Despite being the ace, he betrayed the country that took him in and raised him. Freedom incurred a substantial reparation debt due to their defeat. As they couldn't pay the debt, all the capable individuals were taken away as slaves, leading to their current state. Crush clenched her hands in anger, expressing her unforgiveness for the betrayal, but acknowledging Drek's formidable abilities. She doubted that even with Toko and Yuri on the same team, they might struggle to win against them. Worried expressions appeared on everyone's faces as they contemplated the limited time left for training, only one month before the crucial game. Toko stood up and emphasized that postponing the match further might be challenging for the enslaved people. Clapping his hands to bring everyone back to reality, he encouraged them to face the upcoming fight positively, considering the one-month time as a blessing. Yuri agreed, but also voiced concern about the strength of the other team, questioning if Toko had a plan in mind. Toko requested additional information about the opposing team, prompting Yuri to reveal that they possessed a memory crystal documenting a previous match against them. Yuri proposed a discussion while watching the recorded game. Meanwhile, in the capital of the watershed town known as WST Drek, a bunny named El Aera elaborated on recent events to a person seated behind a desk in a spacious room. El Aera questioned the necessity of dealing with Wolfsmund and freedom, labeling both countries as weak and already subdued. He argued that there was no tangible gain to be had from defeating them, and therefore, displaying good sportsmanship seemed unnecessary. El Aira signaled for a girl bunny named Inra, identified as a grim reaper, to enter the room. Her task was to handle the matters concerning Wolfsmund and freedom. 
In the strategy room of Wolfsmund, they all gathered around a memory crystal, attentively observing a previous match of WST. Toko couldn't help but notice the superior skills of the WST team compared to Wolfsmund. It was expected that their team composition was better than Freedom, but the revelation that they outclassed Wolfsmund was truly surprising. Crush remarked that, judging from this match, WST's strength seemed to match that of Drek. Farah contributed by emphasizing the incredible speed of the rabbit folks, making it challenging to catch them when they made a run for it. Urib highlighted the tight defense of WST, stating that even if they managed to hit Drek's breaking balls, they still face challenges from their formidable fielders. Toko expressed skepticism, believing that despite their apparent strengths, WST must have weaknesses. He reasoned that to exploit these weaknesses, a substantial amount of training would be necessary. Suddenly, Riem loudly told Marin that something really bad had happened at Freedom. In a rush, they all quickly went to the teleportation circle to get to Freedom. The scene there was terrible everything was on fire, turning into ashes. It was difficult for anyone to believe or understand how this could happen. Since it was late at night, the kids were probably asleep, and the worst fears about them being in the burning house might come true. Everyone started shouting, trying to check if any kids were still inside the burning house. Tears rolled down their eyes, and their hearts pounded loudly with extreme fear. Suddenly, the kids came out of the forest. Running and crying, they approached the adults and hugged them tightly. They had been scared and hid in the forest to save themselves from the fire. Everyone felt relieved seeing the kids safe. Farah told Toko that she could smell oil strongly, suggesting the house fire was likely intentional, not an accident. Nina asked what happened and why the kids were outside at that hour. Suddenly, Yuri sensed a presence and they saw a figure running into the forest. Toko told Marin to get a light and follow them, emphasizing the need to catch the girl quickly. Yuri suggested a break and he would go after her. Surprisingly, Toko, being human, was faster than Yuri, surprising him. Years of high school training paid off, and Toko displayed remarkable concentration, quick decision-making, fast reflexes, and physical strength to achieve extraordinary feats. In Japan, baseball is a significant sport attracting many due to the money involved. Tokonatsu stood out as one of the chosen few recognized as a physical elite. Inra was surprised at how Toko kept up with her high speed. As she reached a dead end, she decided to use magic to escape. Just as Toko was about to catch her, she adjusted her cloak, threw it towards him, and leaped off a cliff. Despite Toko's attempt to catch her, she vanished into thin air. Yuri arrived and asked where she went, but Toko informed him that she had managed to escape. Yuri asked for the robe, the girl left behind to sniff and find clues about her. With just one sniff, he discovered it smelled like rabbit folks. Toko wondered if the lizard guy was involved, and Yuri wasn't sure if she was part of WSD. When they declared war against WSD, a fire broke out. Drek brought a shady-looking rabbit folk, making it seem more than a coincidence. Marin said it indicates the fire was man-made. Toko asked how someone could start a fire when violence is only allowed in baseball matches. Marin explained that God watches over Galia through us fairies and there are places our eyes can't reach. Without evidence, there's nothing they can do. After a while, they returned to the village. Crush asked about the person who ran away, but Toko shook his head, indicating no. He inquired about the kids, and Crush said they were with Nina, sent to Wolfsmund for safety using teleportation crystals. The village was entirely burned to ashes, and it seemed impossible for anyone to live there now. Houses and fields were completely destroyed. Farah mentioned that Wolfsmund had some reserves left, so things would be okay for a while. Toko instructed everyone to go back to Wolfsmund, and he and Yuri would stay the night to discuss something. He also requested Marin to stay with them for security reasons. After everyone else left, cautioning them to be careful, Yuri asked Toko what he wanted to talk about. Toko explained that it was something he couldn't easily bring up in Wolfsmund. He mentioned a hot spring, suggesting they clean up after the chase and discuss things during the bath. 
Yuri agreed, but then he realized they would be going together. Toko reassured him, saying they're both guys, so it shouldn't be a problem. Yuri's face turned pale, as if he had seen a ghost. In the hot spring, Toko took off his shirt and prepared for the bath, while Yuri stood in a corner without moving. Marin left, saying she'd keep an eye outside and inform them if anything happened. Toko asked Yuri why he wasn't coming inside. Yuri told him to be quiet, go in first, and he would follow. Yuri was still standing there in shock. The truth emerged Yuri was actually a female werewolf, but the people in Freedom believed she was a boy. While it's not that females are useless in a wolf pack, in many races, males have a higher standing. So, Yuri had to pretend to be a guy, as women are often underestimated. Revealing this secret to the guy who just defeated her was terrible news. As a former leader, she was willing to risk everything to hide her secret. She undressed and tied a cloth around her waist. In the water, Toko was having a great time as the hot water washed away his tiredness, while Yuri stood a few feet away, facing the opposite direction. Toko asked why she was standing so far, and Yuri said she liked her space, suggesting they could just talk from there. Yuri asked him to get to the point and tell her what he wanted to discuss, wondering if it was something he wanted to keep secret from the others at Wolfsmund. Toko asked a direct question about how trustworthy Wolfsmund is for freedom. He shared that he trusts Yuri, appreciating how few would go to such lengths to risk their lives for their people. However, he admitted not knowing much about the others. After the match, other Wolfsman guys seemed ready to harm everyone in freedom. He knew the opponent was much stronger this time, so things wouldn't be easy, and there was a chance someone might sabotage the game. He wanted to absorb Wolfsmund to increase the team's manpower. However, he wasn't sure if he could trust those guys, risking putting them on the field. Yuri understood why he saw Wolfsmund as a threat, considering they tried to harm freedom. Yuri assured him that Pharaoh wasn't involved, so he could vouch for her. However, Yuri was uncertain about the others, as many were unhappy with the merge. Yuri observed Toko's body and thought it was better than average for a human, but he believed there must be more to his pitching success. Yuri assured him that he would keep an eye on everyone to prevent any problems. Toko warned him that if someone wanted to sabotage the game, they could do it anytime. Fairies always watch the game, but accidents can still happen and be used as a cover. Yuri agreed that a baseball hitting a batter is normal, but since Toko is crucial for freedom, someone might try to harm him for their victory. Yuri asked if Toko had a plan. Toko gently held her arms, expressing that he wanted Yuri to become their backup pitcher. Yuri felt embarrassed being so close to a boy while not wearing anything. Unaware of her feelings, Toko continued, stating he didn't intend to play dirty, but they needed to be prepared. In case anything happened to him, having a backup pitcher would be reassuring. He also asked Yuri to take care of the outfield, apologizing for putting many responsibilities on her. Toko kept motivating Yuri as a man, but Yuri's mind was occupied with thoughts of him being too close. After a while, Toko got up and left the bath. Outside, while looking at the sky, he was planning the next steps. With new players on the team, the next phase involved special training for the upcoming big challenge. He realized they needed to strengthen their defense, or they would lose. Everyone had to improve their basics and stamina, with more training to build their core strength. Batters had to aim for a higher hitting average against fast balls. Yuri could use some guidance with pitching, and Toko had to train himself while also training everyone else. He thought about letting someone else handle basic training, but quickly dismissed the idea, realizing it wouldn't be effective without someone pushing them to their limits. They only had one month, so if they didn't make the most out of it, winning against WST would be difficult. Yuri couldn't share the burden since he already had a lot on his plate. The only option left was for Toko to do everything by himself. As he looked at the cemetery honoring those who died as slaves, Toko felt a renewed determination to win at any cost. The next morning at the Wolfsmund ground, everyone was waiting when Toko and Yuri arrived. Toko asked if they had finished their warm-up. 
Crush noticed that Nina wasn't there, but Toko explained she would sit out this time. Nina had given her best as their 1B, but now she was suffering from shoulder pain, so they shouldn't push her more. She would be working with Marin behind the scenes. Toko informed everyone gathered that they would be the team's starters. After assigning positions, he felt more confident than ever that they could beat the Shift Rabbits with this lineup. They would all undergo special training, but before going into details, Toko drew something on the board and asked them to take a look. He reminded them of the events from yesterday's match against Wolfsmund. Then he asked Crush where she was at that time, and she answered that, being a catcher, she was on the home base. Toko warned her that if she repeated that mistake, he'd make her run laps for three hours straight. He explained that when such a thing happens, she should run to first base to cover for any throwing errors as it's also a catcher's duty. The same rule applied to all positions. Defense isn't just about catching balls, but being ready for anything. He hadn't mentioned this earlier because they only had a week to train, but now they had a full month. He was determined to instill this awareness at any cost. With a stern tone, he instructed everyone to take their positions. Seeing their carefree attitude, he chuckled and wondered if they would maintain it until the end. In just one hour, everyone was already tired. Toko yelled at Datshun to give his best covering third base. The training turned out to be tougher than any of them expected. Toko saw that everyone was worn out. Covering all bases meant they would be running around the whole game, requiring nine times more stamina. WST seemed to be a team earning runs using their feet. There would likely be many infield balls, so effective coverage would be key to their victory. To achieve that, everyone needed to get stronger. Natural talent could only take them so far, they needed a trainer to push them beyond their limits. During their training, an elderly dwarf named Gammon, who happened to be Addy's grandpa from a neighboring dwarf nation, arrived. ATI introduced him to Toko. Gammon, Nina's father-in-law and Addy's grandpa, explained that he didn't come to meet his granddaughter, but was intrigued by Toko due to his request for hula hoops. Gammon wanted to know where Toko got the idea of using hula hoops for core strength. However, he expressed concern that they wouldn't beat WSD because Toko had no time for his own training. He emphasized that even an amazing sword in the hands of a sluggish swordsman becomes a dull blade, a saying they often used. Gammon came to prevent Toko from becoming a dull blade. Toko, puzzled, didn't fully grasp Gammon's words. The old man invited him to follow, mentioning a place he called the Baseball Dungeon, a spot he spent half his life building. Gammon believed this place would help Toko improve his baseball skills. In the month-long training for the baseball match against WSD, Toko emphasized defense. Everyone was working hard to be ready for the big day. With many people training in one place, they had to be alert not only for balls coming their way, but also for those that might slip through other defenders. Everyone practiced hard, facing various situations, even though younger members sometimes felt sick during training. With the match approaching, tension was high, and everyone kept giving their best. However, there was one thing that everyone complained about the baseball dungeon made by Gammon. You might be curious about how that dungeon aids in baseball practice. Players need to navigate an abandoned mine chased by monsters through sand and dunes. Challenges include rope climbing, finding underwater keys, and ball shooters crafted by dwarves. Additionally, there are puzzles in various locations. Progress is only possible by successfully solving these puzzles. Failure results in attacks by different monsters within a set time. While not dangerous, these monsters have a fondness for sweat. Outside the dungeon, Toko explained the key elements they needed to work on for baseball success. He believed the dungeon was the most effective method he could offer at the moment. Due to his own training commitments, he couldn't coach them all the time. So, he requested everyone to give their best to clear the dungeon. Besides the dungeon training, the team also worked hard at the dwarves' training grounds with a major focus on catching the ball. Toko could see improvements in each of them. And just like that, the month-long training came to an end. 
In the bustling capital of WST, a sizable crowd had gathered with eager anticipation to witness the match. The enthusiastic spectators cheered loudly, expressing their fervent support for the home team. As the referee Ferry officially commenced the match between Freedom and WST, Ferry Little, representing WST, took a moment to inform Marin about the high stakes involved. According to the rules, if WST emerged as the losing side, they pledged to clear all of Wolfsman's debt and release the enslaved individuals. Conversely, if Freedom were to lose, they would find themselves subjected to becoming WST's colony. The weight of these consequences hung in the air as the teams prepared for the showdown on the baseball field. Marin, seeking clarification, sought Liddell's permission to pose a question. She raised a crucial point about WST exploiting loopholes in the baseball pact, engaging in what she perceived as an illegal act. Marin questioned why Liddell had not reported this to God. Liddell calmly denied any wrongdoing, asserting that their actions were not in violation of the rules. Maintaining an indifferent expression, he pondered whether reporting such matters to God was truly necessary, suggesting that focusing on more significant concerns should take precedence over trivial issues. Toko spotted the girl who had set the Freedom Village on fire and asked her for confirmation. Initially uncertain, Toko became sure upon seeing her up close, remembering that she was hiding in the forest that night. The girl turned around and witnessed an unexpected sight Toko smiling gently. He expressed gratitude, acknowledging that because of her, all the kids were safe. Another rabbit guy approached and quietly told her not to waste time talking to those he considered filthy and inferior. He emphasized their role in judging and punishing them as deserved. The crowd, predominantly supporting the WST team, cheered for their victory and wished misfortune on freedom. It became evident that the residents of WST held strong biases against other nations. The game kicked off with Toko as the pitcher and a peculiar-looking bunny guy as the batter. Meanwhile, the man who had taken Inra away earlier observed them comfortably from a sofa. He considered that if these guys could defeat werewolves, throwing a magical ball was probably not a surprise. However, he emphasized that their game was different, focusing on high-speed plays using their legs to outpace opponents. The prospect of a magic ball didn't bother them. He believed that if Freedom made a mistake, WST would seize the opportunity to dominate the game. The first ball resulted in a strikeout, followed by another, leading to three outs and a change in play. Toko felt confident, thinking he had already figured out their game, concluding that there was no need to fear these rabbits. As Drek prepared to step onto the pitch, the catcher advised him to take the match seriously. He gestured towards Toko, claiming that the human had malicious intent and would spread the seeds of defiance to others. Despite this, Drek was determined not to let it happen, confident that they would defeat Toko today. In response, Drek dismissively stated that he didn't care about resentments or revenge. His sole focus was to disrupt their plans from the very beginning. The next was a showdown between Crush and Drek. Crush was filled with resentment and frustration, but Drek made it clear that he didn't care about what she thought of him. He even mentioned he never expected to see their miserable faces again. This angered Crush, and she reminded him of her father, the one who picked him up, raised him well, and treated him like his own child. Instead of gratitude, he betrayed her father. With an evil grin, Drek said he didn't care about her or her father. Instead, he believed freedom should be grateful to have crossed paths with him. He claimed he would be the one ruling the kingdom of Galia one day. He was angry that people from Freedom, who he considered lowly, dared to challenge him in baseball. He wanted to make them regret their mistake and show them the harsh reality of the world. Now it was Toko's turn, a battle between the aces of both teams. The winner here would have the advantage for the rest of the game. FM Dreek noticed Toko, despite being a right-handed pitcher, batted from the left side. With an evil smile, he warned Toko to watch out, as he might break his arm or leg. Toko seized the moment and provoked him, saying his weak pitches couldn't touch him. In a fit of anger, Drek threw a powerful ball at Toko, who managed to hit it, but it ended up being a foul. 
Drek's anger increased seeing Toko hit his straight ball on the first try. The team's catcher told Drek to calm down, explaining it was just a foul. He warned Drek not to fall for Toko's tricks, as Toko was trying to rile him up. Toko's head was filled with thoughts. While he managed to hit the ball, he hadn't been training for fast balls, feeling a bit rusty in that aspect. Another ball came, and he couldn't hit it this time either. He thought if the exchange had gone the way he wanted, it would have been a good hit, but the guy next to him had good composure. Everyone on the opposite team was troublesome in their own way, but the biggest challenge was the lizard guy. His reckless fast balls were no joke. Experiencing one strike, followed by a second, the batter was declared out, leaving the entire team astounded. All their expectations were pinned on Toko, and the uncertain future was beyond their imagination. Drek's response was a burst of hysterical laughter, unsettling Toko. Despite being aware of the effectiveness of his curvy balls, as evidenced in the recording of his slider curving right in front of the base, Toko felt a sense of unease. To stand even a slim chance at victory, it was imperative to find a way to eliminate Drek, no matter the method chosen. The game was reaching the fourth innings. The catcher of WST told his team that it looks like Freedom is taking the game lightly, as they haven't scored any runs even after four innings. Now is the time to start being more serious. The team agreed, and he motivated them to go back in the stadium and show Freedom the strength of rabbit folks. Toko stepped on the mound, determined to turn the game around this time. He noticed that the batter this time is in the second rotation. Although he didn't get any hits in the first rotation, he got the ball rolling this time. Toko was worried that he wouldn't be able to stop them from bunting any longer. Swinging the bat and getting a hit is tougher than bunting. But bunting is actually harder than many people realize. When swinging, the player has to get the timing, the angle of the bat, and the ball's path to match. In bunting, you only need to aim for the ball's path. This means the batter has fewer things to think about. Moreover, even if the ball makes clumsy contact with the bat, as long as it's rolling, something will happen for sure. He quickly cautioned the third base that this ball is going to be strong, so stay alert. It became evident to the opposing team that the third base is the weak link in freedom. ATI apologized, but others reassured her not to worry. Toko observed that their runner finally got free one is out, and one runner is on first base. From studying the recording, he knew what was coming their way next. They called in a substitute pinch runner. Gammon mentioned that this clever trick of substituting the pinch runner is what made rabbit folks known for their high-speed baseball. Nina also concurred, stating they're using the pinch runner to aim for the next base. Gammon added that they have more than one motive behind this substitution. Another aim is to put pressure on the pitcher with this kind of high-speed game. With the pinch runner in action, the pitcher can't fully concentrate on the batter. If the pitcher lets their guard down even for a moment, the pinch runner will use the chance to reach the next base. Many teams have struggled against WST's high-speed ball, but Toko had confidence in Toko's abilities. He was also crafting a plan in his mind to tackle this issue. Realizing he can't just aim for her since she's going to run anyway, his team had practiced for this scenario, so they shouldn't underestimate them. The next ball was intense, landing in Iris's hands. However, she misunderstood Inra's high speed, and despite Toko yelling for her to stop, she threw the ball. With superhuman speed, Inra sprinted towards the second base. Toko was concerned that they might not make it in time. This time, the ball ended up in Addy's hands, but Inra suddenly halted midway, performing a backflip and landing behind ATI, prompting cheers from the crowd. Despite ATI feeling apologetic, Toko reassured her, attributing the team's challenge to the other side being better. While Toko strategized to prevent runs, WST once again substituted a batter, a player Toko hadn't seen in the recording. Seeing Toko's worried expression, Crush yelled that orcs are strong but slow, and they wouldn't lose to someone like that. Toko observed that the orc seemed unfocused and not threatening. However, the decision to send him into the game at this moment made Toko uneasy. With this in mind, he decided to throw a hard ball this time. 
Drek was surprised by Toko's ability to throw such balls, while Crush confidently believed she could catch this curving magic ball without much difficulty. Suddenly, he noticed something unusual Inra was sprinting towards the home base. Toko realized that WST had sent the big guy just to serve as a distraction. He shouted a warning to third base, but Inra was already at the mound. They finally secured their first run against Freedom, earning loud cheers from the crowd for their remarkable performance. Rabbits, with their comparatively faster legs, don't rely on home runs or powerful hits to win. All they need is their speed, which is how they dominate every match they play. This epitomizes why WST is renowned for its high-speed baseball.